Uh, good morning, everyone, uh, to everyone watching here in New York, and good evening to our speakers and audience members coming to us virtually across China. My name is Victoria, and I'm the current co-president of the Urban China Network of Columbia University's Graduate School of Architectural Planning and Preservation. On behalf of my team, I extend everyone a warm welcome to day one of the ninth annual Urban China Forum, sponsored by the Urban Planning Program and the Weatherhead East Asian Institute here at Columbia. We extend special thanks to our sponsors and to the support of Columbia Global Centers who are streaming our event through their online WeChat platform. The Urban China Network was founded in May 2013 by a group of Columbia urban planning students with a strong interest in China's urban issues. UCN aims to bring students, scholars, and practitioners from various disciplines here in the United States into a discussion of China's urbanization and ultimately to facilitate the communication between cities in China and the US and speak a little more and to speak a little more about the special relationship between Columbia's Chinese students and academic scholars. Here is Ms. Helena Xiao, Associate Director of Columbia Global Center Beijing, who joins us virtually today from China. Good evening, Helena. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good evening, and good afternoon uh, to all the distinguished guests and friends around the world. Uh, thank you in advance for spending some time with us today. I'm extremely proud to be uh, invited to the nice conference of Urban China Forum. Uh, so as uh, Victoria introduced, I uh, represent the Columbia Global Centers Beijing, which is a regional hub in China of Columbia University. Um, our mission is to uh, facilitate and promote academic exchange and research collaboration um, between Columbia students, faculty member uh, with their counterparts in the region. Uh, before 2020, hundreds of students, uh, scholars, and administrators participated in various program and events each year in China. Uh, so if you are interested, our office is located in Zhongguancun area on the upper east west side of Beijing. So we would be very pleased to have you visit us while you are in the city. Um, it is uh, very much pride that our student at the urban planning department at Columbia Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and uh, Preservation, one of the best major at the university as well as in the, in the country, uh, have brought together amazing scholars from Columbia and China, and they will uh, facilitate in the following discussion. So this year's same uh, sustainable urban planning in China, in my view, is focusing on a very timely and critical issue which, uh, which correspond with a critical uh, national concern in the country, in China, as well as a global concern in the post-pandemic uh, era. Therefore, uh, we anticipated that the academic insights and best practices presented and discussed at the two-day conference will serve as useful references and inspirations for uh, our participants and audiences as we contemplate and solve problems in, in the region. So I hope that everyone uh, who participated in uh, today's di discussion, tomorrow's discussion will enjoy them and we'll be able to have an opportunity to engage with uh, the scholars we invited on the questions you are seeking answer to. I also look forward to receiving suggestions and ideas on how to follow up on the academic exchange and collaborations uh, with, uh, with UCN, with Columbia GSAP, as well as the global centers in, in this area. I look forward to receiving uh, more good news. And now uh, I'll give back to Victoria to proceed with the following uh, answer. Wish the, uh, you will all enjoy the discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, Elena, for your support. Um, the theme of our forum this year is sustainable urban planning. Today, we have two distinguished guests who are speaking on how their research inter intersects with urban sustainability. Here to speak a little on our forum is our urban planning director, an internationally acclaimed scholar. Her recent work, China Urbanization Impacts and Transitions, looks at the interdisciplinary issues of Chinese urbanism from a historical and regional perspective. It is my honor to welcome Professor Wei Ping Wu. Thank you, uh, Victoria. And uh, welcome all, wherever you are, um, to this uh, Urban China Forum. And, uh, you know, the major up 
side of this virtual and hybrid format is that we're able to connect with scholars in China, uh, in Hong Kong, and our alum, I see from the uh, participant list, we have some alumni there and really a welcome back and really great to see you all. So major thanks and big round of applause for our students and they've done a terrific job organizing this year's forum. And thanks to the two esteemed speakers today, Professor Li and Professor Tian. And it's really great to see you all, even though it's on the smaller screen. And then I hope you all will tune in tomorrow. And thanks to the Columbia Global Center in Beijing, especially uh, Helena. So this China Urban Forum, our Urban China Forum has been ongoing every year for a number of years now, uh, something like 15 or 16 years. And it's been a terrific platform for us to think about what China is facing and how cities are you know, coping with challenges across different geographies in perhaps similar or different ways. And I really would like to kind of draw your attention a little bit to the major stakes uh, that cities are facing today, not only in China, but also across the world. And so uh, Victoria mentioned the book, Urban uh, China Urbanizing Impacts and Transitions that I, uh, together with a number of colleagues recently published uh, at University of Pennsylvania Press was exactly actually the outcome of the Urban China Forum um, that we held in uh, 2019, just before pandemic. So pandemic really forced us to also think about some of the challenges. So I just like to outline four and, and particularly I think uh, are relevant to this year's forum. And then number one is of course, climate change. And not only climate change, but also I think for Chinese cities, climate change poses an important transition point. That is many, much of the progress or a lot of the progress that Chinese cities have made might be wiped away by challenges of climate. And um, this is what we call developmental delay in the book, we can uh, address that issue. Second transition has to do with what we call environmental transition, and which is very much the focus of this time, uh, the Urban China Forum. That is, we have seen that Chinese cities, because of its rapid pace and scope of development, are witnessing both phenomena that are characteristics of global South cities, well, other cities in China are experiencing phenomena that are more typical of global North cities. So this kind of transitional state is rather unique and rather you know, urgent for Chinese cities. And then third, obviously, is what we have observed for a number of years now, the demographic shift or transition. The, rapidly aging society that we are all seeing, not only in China, but in many other countries. Last but not least is uh, the technological shift and pandemic very much illustrated that, that the use of digital technology and other types of technological platforms in urban governance and management and China obviously is on the cutting edge of doing that. So I hope through this forum, uh, some of these transitional issues are going to be discussed further. And I very much look forward uh, to the presentations and discussions. Again, uh, thank you all and welcome. Thank you, Professor Weiping. Um, a, a gentle reminder to our audience members that each speaker will have 30 minutes lecture and followed by a five minutes of immediate questions. And after both lectures, the discussion panel will be opened up to the public. Please enter your questions in the chat or online and use the raise hand function to indicate you wish to speak. Here's our communications coordinator and our first year, Jiang Chen, to like introduce you our first speaker.
Okay, thank you, Victoria. It's a great honor to have our first speaker, Professor Li Tian. Professor Tian is a PhD supervisor and the jumpy head of the Department of Urban Planning at Tsinghua University. Her research focuses on urbanization and land use studies. Professor Tian has a great number of publications in both Chinese and English, including 14 books and more than 130 journal papers with 30 SSCI or SAI papers at the first or corresponding authors. Besides her extensive research, Professor Tian has also been planning leads for many urban design projects in Chinese cities. From 2014 to 2020, she was listed as the most cited Chinese scholars for six consecutive years. Now I'll hand over to Professor Tian and welcome her to talk about urban regeneration in China. Okay, uh, thank you. I'll uh, share my uh, screen. Uh, can everybody see the screen, the slide? Yes, we can see it very well. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, good evening or good morning or good afternoon, whatever. Uh, it's my uh, great pleasure to um, join in this interesting uh, forum. Uh, uh, so thanks for the invitation uh, to share my recent research uh, with you. Oh, my topic is um, transition of urban planning and the planning uh, urban renew and the planning uh, responses in China. Uh, analytical framework of government market society relationship. Uh, to be short, uh, GMS relationship. I'm going to briefly uh, talk about five parts, uh, introduction, uh, GMS relationship in urban renew of China and the urban renew practice and the planning uh, responses of max cities in the four uh, first tier cities of China, uh, Beishang, Guangxin. And then we compile the urban renew models of this uh, four cities uh, based on uh, analytical framework of GMS relationship. And it concludes with um, some discussions and the policy implications. Uh, as Professor Wu mentioned, we are facing a transition um, era. Uh, in, in China, during the 14th five-year plan period, urban renew has become a key national strategy, uh, indicating that as a planning for growth has turned into planning for uh, redevelopment. Uh, we can uh, divide uh, the urban renew of China since 1990 into three stages. The first stage uh, was from, is from 1990 to early uh, 2000s uh, urban renewal was led by surprising secondary industries and developing tertiary industries, Tuer uh, Jing San and dilapidated building renovation, uh, Wei Gai. Um, in 2008, three old renewal policy, three old means uh, old factories, old villages, and old communities, uh, was initiated by. Uh, Ministry of Land Resources and Guangdong Province. Uh, its um, key points are uh, decentralization, uh, you know, to break the monopoly, the land monopoly of uh, state, local state in the primary land market and encouraging uh, the original land users and developers to initiate the development themselves. So during this period, uh, urban renew was characterized by uh, property light reconstruction. Uh, but since uh, 2016, uh, many changes have taken place in the urban renew field. Uh, many uh, cities uh, claim this you know, ur new urban uh, renew strategy as integrated redevelopment and the patchwork renovation, Chengpian Gai Zao He Wei Gai Zao. Uh, it means, you know, the centralization of uh, state power and, uh, you know, the coordinating or coordination the role of local government has been enhanced since then. Uh, in this research, we are going to address three key research questions. 
uh, what are the characteristics of GMS relationship in urban renewal of China, and what are the local planning uh, responses in these mega cities. Uh, third issue is how has the GMS relationship influenced urban renewal in mega cities of Beijing, Guangxi? Uh, this part, part two, examines uh, you know the the theoretical issue GMS uh, relationship in urban renewal. Firstly, we are going to uh, you know we we go through uh, the classic debates uh, over station uh, interventionism and the neoliberalism. Uh, <laughs> Keynes, uh, you know, as many of you may have known, uh, Keynes uh, opposes lazy fire and advocates the expansion of government functions. The state interventionism actually played a significant role in the New Deal uh, in the United States and post-war prosperity in European countries after uh, World War II. Uh, Neo, uh, neoliberalism, the representative is um, you know, Hayek. He uh, believes uh, in the self-correcting power of the invisible hand of the market. And he argues the role of government should be limited to maintain the rule of law and avoid getting involved in other areas as much as possible. You know, the Reagan administration of US and the Schedule government of the UK warmly embraced neoliberalism uh, in the 1980, 1980s. And uh, since then, neoliberalism has replaced the dominant position of Keynesianism in the West. Uh, many, uh, you know, many scholars argue urban planning uh, should leave enough space for the liberal order to play its role and prevent the government from abusing authority in planning administration uh, during the, you know, in particular in the early stage of reform opening in China. Uh, here we uh, analyze the roles of stakeholders in urban uh, renewal of China. First, the, the, firstly, we are going to uh, look at the role of government because government plays a dominant role in the economic growth uh, of China, uh, central government actually, uh, you know, its objective is uh, maintain political stability and governing legitimacy and economic and social considerations are also the objectives, but not the priority. Uh, for local government, they, they want to maximize fiscal revenue and upgrade industrial structure, uh, you know, improve the quality of urban development and government sectors and individual officials, they have uh, their own objectives in urban renew. Uh, developer, for developers, um, you know, their objectives are very clear to reduce costs and increase profits to maximize their benefits. For original, you know, relocated uh, property owner, the claim high compensation as much as possible, sometimes even unearned interest. In Chinese, So uh, in the power structure of China, government plays uh, a dominant role and is responsible for allocating space resources and making uh, urban renewal rules. Uh, market, of course, is very uh, plays an essential role in uh, implementing urban renewal planning, but uh, its role is subject to the control of government. In China, social forces have long been very weak in the power structure of China. Uh, since the 19th National Congress, the state has attached uh, greater importance on uh, urban communities governance based on party grassroots cultivation. This part, uh, we are going to uh, examine the practice and the planning response, responses of this uh, four or max cities. Uh, first, let's, uh, first case is Beijing. 
according to uh, the Urban Renewal Planning of Beijing published two years ago, uh, land to be uh, renewed in the central city accounts for uh, more than 50% of the city's total and the floor space area of urban renewal is very large, as high as uh, 245 million square meters. And most of this uh, uh, renewed uh, space is located in the central city. In terms of in urban renewal of Beijing, uh, we call it you know, GMS uh, relationship as government light, uh, state-owned enterprises. Uh, SOES are in charge of uh, implementation. Uh, social capital has been encouraged to participate in the urban renewal. Uh, in the central city, uh, the renovation uh, old residential areas and dilapidated buildings are mainly have mainly uh, have been mainly funded by uh, municipal and uh, district uh, level governments. So we call this as kind of paternalism. Although a uh, market has been encouraged to participate in, in the urban renewal, but uh, um, you know, the strict planning control uh, has left very little space uh, for developers to make profit. According to the uh, planning of uh, urban planning master planning of Beijing, uh, no extra space uh, has been allowed to be added in the urban renewal of central city. So there are only three paths uh, to, um, of land appreciation. For example, functional changes, uh, reutilization of idle space and the provision of community value added services. However, in many cases, uh, this uh, kind of um, value added, uh, you know, profit is not is uh, not sufficient from covering the costs of urban renew. Uh, Beijing uh, proposed a uh, policy framework. One means uh, Beijing urban renew regulation. Uh, plus N management policies and X uh, policy documents and standards. Uh, correspondingly, it established a uh, three uh, level of urban renewal planning system, including a citywide urban renewal subject plan, regulatory planning for blocks and urban renewal action plan um, for, for those uh, blocks and the different uh, types of space. Shanghai, since, uh, since, since 2000, Shanghai's urban renew has experienced three stages. In the first decade, urban renew was led, uh, was led by mega projects such as Shanghai Expo and historical area revitalization. Mm -hmm. In the second decade, urban renew focused on central city uh, incremental renovation. But since last year, Shanghai government clarified its urban renewal strategy as government light SOES operated incremental uh, renew, urban renew. So its GMS relationship is basically, you know, government light and uh, municipal government classifies uh, urban renewal projects into two kinds of projects. Mm -hmm. One is government-led projects, uh, which uh, which were which will be led by uh, government platform and SOES platform. Uh, such projects have multiple considerations. Uh, the second category is market-led urban renewal projects, but uh, uh, its scale. Uh, has been strictly uh, controlled to avoid the negative influence on the land leasing revenue of uh, government in the primary land market. Shanghai also established, uh, you know, a three level uh, of urban renewal action planning system last year. 
including citywide urban renewal guidelines, urban renewal action plan for special regions, and an urban renewal implementation plan for block and projects. Uh, Guangzhou uh, has adopted you know, different urban renewal strategies from Beijing and Shanghai. Since 2000, we also uh, divided uh, its urban renewal into three stages. Uh, in the from 2000 to 2008, uh, also character uh, urban renewal was characterized by uh, delightful building reconstruction and industrial upgrading. After the 2008 3 renew, uh, <coughs> the the renew actually during this period was uh, mainly property led reconstruction, uh, but since 2000. 16, Guangzhou government enhanced its control uh, on, on market participation. So it proposed uh, uh, the strategy, renewed strategy, so-called integrated redevelopment and patchwork renovation. <coughs> uh, we named the GMS relationship of Guangzhou urban renew as government-led and market-oriented. Uh, the three O's renew is kind of you know decentralization and encourage uh, the the initiation of redevelopment by land users and developers. So in this period, it was bottom up fragmented redevelopment uh, by driven by real estate development. Uh, but this has brought uh, many challenges on the land leasing revenue of government in the primary land market. So uh, Guangzhou municipal government made a, a lot of changes uh, for the urban renew since 2016. In Guangzhou, social forces are kind of uh, very different from uh, those in Beijing and Shanghai because Klein plays, uh, plays an important role in renew. Uh, these clients have strong capability to mobilize economic and social capital. So, so usually the village um, you know, requires high compensation for demolition and uh, reconstruction, relocation. Uh, Guangzhou urban planning, uh, urban renewal planning system has experienced several changes uh, since uh, the since uh, the three O's renew, now it has established a four level uh, urban renew planning system, including citywide urban renew subject plan, special area renew plan is established to coordinate the develop the redevelopment of different renew unit. Uh, the third level is a renew unit. Um, based on basically based on blocks and project implementation scheme. Uh, in terms of Shenzhen, it's uh, urban uh, renewal stage uh, classification is uh, very similar to that of Guangzhou. And uh, diff but different from Guangzhou, during the three O's renewal period, Shenzhen municipal government claims a positive non interventionism. Uh, <laughs> urban renewal strategy uh, to encourage market play a dominant role in the urban renew. Uh, but since 2016, uh, it also enhanced uh, its control on market operation in the urban renew. Uh, since last year, uh, government led land consolidation in many renewal projects. So a strong client uh, organization, uh, you know, very uh, similar to that, uh, even stronger than those in Guangzhou, has a great impact on urban renew, uh, <coughs> because um, you know, the, and we call that anti-common dilemma caused by those new households. Ding Zhu has become uh, a main main factor of impeding urban renew progress. Uh, so it also established a four level uh, planning, urban re renewal planning system. Uh, part four compares this uh, different urban renewal models uh, in Beishan, Guangsheng. Firstly, we need to understand the changes of 
uh, micro social and economic environment. First change is a shrinkage of local discretion under the central local relationship change. Uh, many economists and uh, scholars attribute uh, the rapid growth of China's economy to fiscal federalism with Chinese characteristics and political decentralization and financial decentralization. Uh, but recently, over the last several years, uh, great changes have taken place. Central government enhanced uh, its control uh, and uh, decreased the space for local discretion. Uh, territorial spatial planning serves as a very important, a key tool for the central government to enhance their control, you know, through um, three zone, uh, three boundaries uh, delimination, uh, you know, which has limited the discretionary power of local government in land expansion. Uh, also, Ministry of uh, housing has uh, issued successfully issued many policies uh, on uh, building regulations uh, in you know across China. For example, uh, they set up the residential height limits and uh, now to exceed uh, eighty meters and uh, you know prevent large scale demolition in urban renew. Uh, so under this. A central local relationship change. Uh, many local governments have to transfer these strategies to patchwork renovation, and the scale of demolition and reconstruction significantly decreased. The second change is transition from property led redevelopment to real estate definancialization. Last year, the central government promulgated the policy. Uh, such as three red lines, which set the limits on uh, debt to asset ratio and cash to debt ratio. This has uh, this has caused a lot of developers, uh, including many big developers, to go into bankruptcy, and caused the you know the so called winter of uh, developers. Third change is transition from neoliberal to neo-nationalist development, which are reflected in, uh, in two aspects. One is uh, mixed ownership of SOEs and the private developers has been promoted with large SOEs occupying the leading and dominant position in the economy. The second aspect is, you know, state acts as a leader, planner, regulator, coordinator, and protector of national economy. And the strength of central government has been continuously enhanced. So in sum, there uh, is a return of state power in urban renew, uh, which are reflected in changes of uh, central local uh, relations, government enterprise, relations and the real estate market policy changes. Uh, meanwhile, local governments face huge financial burdens uh, of renovation of old communities, um, but uh, they have to do bear the cost due to the need of social stability under the paternalism. <clears throat> Here uh, shows uh, you know, the uh, differences and similarities of urban renewal models of Beishang Guangsheng. Uh, we we summarize, uh, you know, these models as follows: Beijing paternalized the government, weak market relying on SOEs and weak society. Shanghai authoritarian government, SOEs run platforms plus market and weak society. Guangzhou in a coordinated government, strong market, and client society. Shenzhen decentralized the government, strong market, and client society. So this day, we don't have time to go through the details of this uh, four models. I, I will briefly talk about several findings uh, based on the comparison. Uh, first, Firstly, a natural endowment and a reliance on our land revenue uh, have great impacts on renewal progress. Shanghai, uh, Shenzhen has been most active to push forward 
uh, the renewal progress through encouraging market uh, participation uh, because you know it has very limited land resources. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the land the proportion of land leasing revenue um, in local revenue only accounted for uh, around 10 percent. Uh, so much less than other three uh, max cities. Guangzhou has been encouraging market participation, but it is cautious to control the scale of um, you know three oats, uh, the uh, bottom up redevelopment, uh, considering that um, you know the three oats uh, has generated some negative impacts on the land leasing revenue of government. Urban renewal of Beijing and Shanghai mainly depends on SOEs. Uh, Beijing um, adopts the strategy of patchwork renovation, and Shanghai combines the reconstruction, the demolition, reconstruction, and patchwork renovation. The second finding is all these four cities have enhanced uh, their planning control recently. Um, this, Basically, the stronger the uh, government intervention, the stronger the rigidity of control and the weaker of motivation for renew. Uh, in Beijing and Shanghai, uh, because they have taken very stringent planning control, so, so the space for uh, market participation has been very limited. In Guangzhou and Shenzhen, recently planning control has been enhanced. And the third funding is shrinking uh, local discretion and market participation, as we as I mentioned earlier. Uh, the fourth uh, for funding is, you know, they have uh, similarities in social exclusion of migrant population. In Guangzhou and Shenzhen, uh, property renewal has excluded uh, migrant population from the central city. In Beijing and Shanghai, social exclusion has been driven by uh, demolition of informal illegal buildings are uh, heavy. As so a GMS um, conflict and the challenges in urban renew, uh, I summarize it into uh, as uh, three contradictions. First contradiction is, uh, you know, is between. Uh, planning control and market motivation. I just mentioned that. Uh, and also, the second contradiction is, uh, you know, that between public finance capacity and paternalized state. Uh, during the pandemic, China's, um, you know, the pandemic and real estate financialization has great significant impacts on the national economy. Uh, this year, the balance in the first half this year, the balance of local revenue and expenditure in all 31 provinces and cities are ne were negative. Uh, and also the third contradiction is that between authoritarian government and grassroots governance, um, uh, social forces have, have always been very weak uh, in, in, in China. So the, the biggest challenge uh, facing urban renew in China is how to strike the balance between market participation and govern, government intervention, uh, how to strike the balance between government control and its capacity building, uh, how to strike the balance between paternalism and social inclusion. Uh, this conclusion, um, you know, we, we Conclusion part, we are, are going to, you know, very briefly go through uh, these three key issues. Uh, first is, you know, I don't have answer to this. Uh, uh, strike the balance between neoliberalism and the neo nationalism. Uh, let the market continue to play an essential role in the urban renew. The second is, um, you know, the local discretion under the evolution of center and the local uh, relations, uh, if it's possible, you know, appropriate relaxation of planning control and, uh, uh, you know, local government's discretion are necessary for effective governance in China.
And third issue is um, transformation from property-led urban renewal to urban regeneration to safeguard the housing rights of uh, more than 300 million uh, migrant population in the urban renewal. So uh, that's I, I think I'm running out of my time. Uh, thank you. Any questions or comments uh, are welcome. Thank you, Professor Chen, for your uh, speech. Now we're opening up a uh, very quick five uh, minutes immediate Q&A for um, this section. Is there any? Okay, um, I'll think of one I, as um, I kind of listened through this um, lecture, first of all, very, a lot of great research and it is very fruitful stake of uh, information for us to look into the current mode and um, possibly the of um, urban planning, this general framework. Um, my question, um, I was thinking, uh, you mentioned in the presentation that um, there's an importance to think about this balance between um, government and market forces in urban planning regime. While this, there is an obvious lacking of social forces um, in the process of um, urban renewal. Um, what kind of, or is there uh, thinking about future in, in innovative um, kind of starting point for maybe the social um, aspect to jump in into um, this urban planning regime, especially for urban renewal in China. Uh, thank you for your question. So your question is how to uh, involve social forces in the urban planning of China, you mean? Because it's not, sometimes it's not very clear, the, the sound. Huh? Yes. Okay. Uh, this is a difficult question because um, recently I'm very interested in the history of China. So I read several books on that. Um, you know, in the 5,000 years history of China, um, the social forces have always been very weak. Um, uh, of course, planners have um, tried their best to uh, participate, uh, you know, to encourage uh, social forces participation in the urban renewal. For example, in Beijing, you probably have heard about uh, Xin Qinghe uh, lab, you know, Xin Qinghe experiment, Xin Qinghe uh, And also uh, government has sent a lot of, uh, we call that uh, community planner, uh, or responsibility planner, some, 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 something like that, you know, 街道规划师或者责任规划师, to help uh, local residents uh, to be involved in uh, urban renewal. Um, but I think this, uh, you know, this is, um, how to say that, um, kind of um, limited, uh, uh, public participation, uh, community pu participation. Uh, for the urban renewal of older communities, uh, of course, uh, the support from local residents is very important. Um, but they don't have much uh, capital, you know, to, to um, initiate the renew. So at this stage, many uh, communities renew uh, have been funded by governments. Uh, but you have, you have, uh, you know, you have seen, you have the, the deficit situation of local governments in, um, you know, during the pandemic period. So I think it's, it's very difficult, but of course we can do something. For example, we also, um, we also, you know, uh, design a platform for, for local residents to participate in the, uh, the urban renew planning, including planning. For example, they can uh, designate where the public facilities uh, can be located and uh, uh, you know, any other uh, opinions 
uh, you know, they want to express in the urban renew so that the planners can, uh, can summarize uh, what they, they want and help them, uh, you know, get more funds, um, you know, but uh, I, I still, uh, you know, I still um, insist that market forces are very, very important, uh, you know, uh, because they have uh, many economic cap uh, capitals to, um, to, you know, provide more public facilities and, uh, uh, you know, help organize uh, the community affairs as etc. Uh, because China is very different from United States because those uh, property are owned by uh, individual uh, individuals. Uh, but in China, in the central cities, uh, in the central area of those mega cities, many old buildings are owned by uh, work units. Uh, those employees uh, have, you know, have left there for like a long time, like for 20 years or 30 years, and they pay a very low rent to, to their employers. But they, 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 they will not invest in uh, the urban renewal uh, in the central area. So that's, uh, that's very different from um, that in, in the United States. So uh, I think a limited uh, planners can help facilitate limited public participation, but uh, you know, just uh, limited because uh, planners don't have much capital in, in helping uh, in pushing forward the, 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 the renewal of, of the communities. I, I, I don't know, it's because this is a complicated issue. Um, you know, social forces actually have been a difficult and a sensitive issue in China. Thank you so much for that, Professor Yu Tian. Um, so we next we have a question from Yining. Oh, I'm, I'm here. Thank you so much, Professor Tian, um, for your presentation. It's very inspiring. And my name is Yining Lei. I am a PhD student at the University of Pennsylvania, but I'm also a GSAP and Tsinghua alum. Uh, so my question is, um, I guess, pretty premature and specific. I am wondering how Shanghai planners uh, will be dealing with their convoluted uh, household registration pattern in, for example, like Shu Kumen, because I, uh, from my understanding, those um, old structures are often registered with a lot of households. And what if urban renewal deemed some of the places unlivable and uh, with that, where should um, those households go? <laughs> uh, thank you for your question, uh, Yi Ming. Huh? Uh, so you, you, were, you are from Shanghai? Yeah, I'm from Shanghai, and I graduated from Tsinghua oh. and then Columbia, and now I'm in um, Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I actually, I think, you know, uh, planners in Shanghai, you know, might be the right person to uh, ask, uh, to answer this question, because I, I just, uh, you know, got some secondhand information uh, from my uh, students uh, at Tongji University, because I, you know, I used to teach there for 10 years. So uh, those, uh, that's, that's, uh, you know, very um, difficult. Uh, issue. Uh, this year, uh, last year, since last year, Shanghai municipal government, uh, you know, because the urban renewal focused on, focuses on central city renovation at this time during, you know, the, the last uh, two or three years. The, uh, I heard, you know, just heard uh, that they, they want to, you know, of course, for those uh, shikumen with historical uh, values, uh, of course, they need to reserve, pre uh, protect, reserve them. But for those, um, you know, shikumen uh, buildings with very low quality, they want to, uh, you know, the municipal government want to 
demolish them and replace the high rise buildings, uh, but not, not high rise buildings, high end buildings with same uh, floor space. So no extra space. So uh, that means uh, the housing price will be as high as like uh, 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 300,000 yuan per square meter or even, you know, something like that. Kind of crazy, um, you know, plan. So it's very difficult to, uh, to you know, to, how to say that, uh, reconstruct uh, those uh, old Shikuman communities uh, with low quality of building. I don't think that's a sustainable solution um, to that. Um, but uh, how to, uh, so, so the progress is very slow at this time. Um, I think in Shanghai, because, you know, in my, in my words, Shanghai, uh, become more and more like Beijing uh, with very, very stringent planning control. Actually, I, I think this is problematic. Um, you know, um, if you insist uh, no extra space, no any new extra space to be added in the urban renewal, it's financially very difficult. So I, I, I actually, I, I don't have a, a clear answer to your question, uh, but I, I also am doing some uh, surveys and uh, uh, collecting the, the policy documents of urban renew to say what what's happening uh, in, in the cities and what will happen in the near future. Thank you. No, thank you for your answer. I think um, these are all very super helpful. And yeah, I, I, I feel like uh, the 14, fifth, um, five year plan did speak a little bit about, especially the, uh, the Shanghai version, did speak a little bit about um, how they're going to deal with Shikuman. And I believe there is a historical preservation um, perspective in there. Um, like they are hoping to offer uh, residents with options if these buildings they think um, are in good value and they are going to preserve them. Um, they are offering um, people options whether they can choose to live in a, uh, like what you said, like the high end quality um, building that may not be at the city center or they can choose to uh, relocate temporarily and then wait for the uh, Shikuman to be redeveloped. So I, I think I'm still optimistic about that, but I like, uh, I, well, I will also need to do some research on my end, but thank you so much for your answer. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Thank you, Amy, for your uh, question. We're just going to move really quickly to Professor Wu. We're running a little bit behind schedule, but um, uh, like we'll we'll make sure that Professor Lee has his full thirty minutes after Professor Wu's question. Okay. Thank you, uh, Tianlongshi. Um, one of your <laughs> points caught my attention. You were saying that so that the decentralization of physical resources for uh, regeneration, it's changing. There's more central controls through spatial planning and territorial planning. And I'm wondering, is there really, there is, is, are there really teeth to that more centralized control? Because revenue-wise, localities are still very much uh, in charge of, you know, the expenditure responsibilities, right? There's no real central resources per se, uh, yes. for regeneration. So really curious about your uh, thought. Oh, yes, this is, yes, this is a key point, yeah. Um, that's kind of, um, you know, dilemma. Yeah, of course, uh, actually, we, we think urban renewal is local issue. It's not a, a you know, a issue which central government should uh, put some controls on that. But unfortunately, um, you know, this kind of transition uh, from, you know, uh, of enhancing central control has been quite obvious uh, uh, since, you know, last year. Uh, particularly in the, you know, in the 
um, restriction on the re demolition and the uh, reconstruction uh, because uh, several uh, you know, officials, uh, local top officials, uh, have been punished because of the you know the re the demolition. Uh, for example, in Guangzhou, because uh, you know of cutting big trees. Uh, so President Xi actually uh, gave some uh, required local government to deal with this kind of issue. So uh, many uh, top officials in Guangzhou were were punished for that. So they became more and more cautious, uh, not to, uh, you know, not to uh, demolish um, some old buildings, um, because yeah, it, you know, local government has to be responsible for its expenditure and its revenue. But uh, uh, in the meantime. This official's promotion is subject to the uh, higher level government. So this this is kind of a dilemma or you know uh, governance. Um, so during you know this pandemic, actually, uh, I think local government has found it very difficult to. Uh, how to say that? You know, uh, last year Shanghai, Shanghai's revenue was higher than its expenditure, but this year it also uh, had uh, the problem of deficit. Um, we don't know. We we uh, how to say that? We uh, expect some big changes after the twentieth National Congress, but <laughs> uh, it's unpredictable. Mm, I think this has been a very big challenge facing uh, local government uh, and also facing central government because of the, you know, the COVID policy. Thank you, Professor Wu. I think you, uh, you asked a very uh, important question, mm, but let's see what will happen mm, recently. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tian and Professor Wu. And um, thank you all for your participation. And now it is my great honor to introduce you to our next forum speaker, Professor Wei Feng Li. Professor Li is Associate Dean of Research and Post uh, for Research Postgraduate Studies and Associate Professor in the Faculty of Architecture and the University of Hong Kong. Since 2011, he has been working in the Department of Urban Planning and Design after receiving his PhD from MIT. His research interests focus on environmental sustainability associated with urbanization and transportation, urban spatial structure and air pollution, health effects, as well as the use of urban modeling, remote sensing, and big data in urban and environmental studies. Besides his academic reputation, Professor Lee is also a member of the editorial board of Transportation Research D, Transport Environment, Honorary Secretary of Building Smart International Hong Kong Chapter and the immediate past president of the Hong Kong GIS Association. He was an associate editor of Journal of Transport and Land Use, and he received International Association for China Planning Distinguished Service Award in 2018. Let's now welcome Professor Wei Feng Li. Okay, thank you very much for your introduction, uh, Wei. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you uh, for your kind invitation to uh, the ninth Urban China Forum, uh, Professor Wu and the Urban China Network team. It is my great uh, pleasure to participate in the forum and present my relevant research, also remotely from Hong Kong. Uh, I would love to be in New York. In fact, it has been three years since my last travel. So uh, Professor Tian has discussed comprehensively on the urban regeneration process in China through the triangles of government, market, and society. So to me, uh, I always believe a regeneration, for example, of urban villages will be the key to the sustainable development in China. So probably I will approach uh, sustainable planning in China from a different perspective, uh, environmental sustainability and justice. So probably more in relation to my research on air pollution. Uh, 
I fully concur with uh, Professor Wu. The pandemic has bring in, uh, brought in significant changes as well as challenges in sustainable urban planning in China. For example, is the intersect between pandemic and climate change and the uh, environmental shift. So uh, probably this is a bit off topic, but I want to start with my talk with the uh, uh, Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences last year. So two economists were uh, awarded because of their methodological contributions to the analysis of causal relationships. So here, two uh, key uh, important messages. So uh, methodological innovations in lieu of those kind of controlled field experiment. And the second one is causal relationships. So why is causal relationship so important? Many of those kind of big questions in the society in urban areas in, deal with cause and effect. For example, when we talk about sustainable urban planning, so similarly, we are interested in understanding those kind of causal effects on urban sustainability of proposed planning, design, policy interventions. For example, I myself are interested in how those kind of alternative urban neighborhood design, for example, can reduce carbon emissions and towards the so-called the carbon neutrality. Or like uh, uh, the impact of new public transport infrastructure on reducing air pollution. So, however, these questions are difficult to answer because we have nothing to use as a comparison. So it will not be possible for us to, to know the results if there had been no uh, new public transport infrastructure, for example, because we can only see the results from uh, new public transport in infrastructure, but not both so that we can compare in the same place. So that's why it leads to uh, those kind of naturalism. Basically, some scholars believe the methods of social science should follow uh, those of the natural science in which a very important component is so-called a controlled uh, field experiment. So in those kind of settings, there are two groups of subjects, one that receives the treatment and the other one doesn't. So here the key is those kind of random assignment. So by incorporating random assignment, or we call chance into the study design. So those kind of uh, controlled experiment uh, gain opportunities to uncover those kind of causal relationships. So for example, it is so interesting. Back in 2019, the Nobel Prize in Economics was awarded to three economics for their experimental approach to alleviating global poverty. So very interestingly, long before the COVID-19, so those kind of economics already highlighted the importance of vaccine on improving health of the poor so that uh, to alleviate poverty. So you can see here, so the different villages were assigned uh, to three different groups by lottery. So here it's a random assignment. And then you can see, so the first group receives nothing and the, it's a control group. And the first so-called treatment group basically had those kind of so-called mobile clinics, which means vaccine were provided 24 hours, seven days per week. And the second uh, achievement group, in addition to uh, mobile clinics, they also received those kind of uh, food incentives, lentils. So we can interpret them as reduced the price of vaccine. So, so in that context, we can contribute to the differences in vaccine rate entirely to the treatment because all else have been well controlled. So the same economics has also done some different to examine those kind of how to improve school performance. For example, by comparing providing more textbooks, providing free lunch, or providing targeted help for weak students. So here, a very important question is, why field uh, experiment, why control the experiment? Because simply comparing schools with different access to uh, textbooks or will not work because the schools could differ in many ways. So one way of circumventing those kind of difficulties is to ensure that the schools become 
being compared have the same average characteristics. So here, very important, how can this be achieved? Still by random assignment, by chance, by lottery. This letting chance decide which schools are placed in the group for comparison. As long as we have large number of schools participating in those kind of experiment, we can make sure those schools in different groups will have similar average characters. So back to sustainable urban planning. So planners could also consider those kind of experiment, control experiment to observe how for say modification, physical form, new urban infrastructure might change urban performance. So here the key is those kind of those kind of interventions would use place-based randomization. So in which those kind of key spaces are chosen as areas for receiving treatment, while similar other spaces don't receive treatment. For example, do street design reduce traffic accidents? Will improvement to lighting sound increase the use of a public park? And what's the impact of, for say, urban infrastructure investment on poverty value? Actually, this is an interesting uh, experiment in Mexico, in which the local government receives only half of the funding requested for infrastructure improvement, so that the local government decided to pave only half of the street by random selection. So this is a perfect controlled experiment. However, you might argue many planning tools and policies cannot be randomized. And another key issue here is whether those kind of experiment results have the so-called external validity. In other words, whether the results apply in other contexts. For example, is it possible to generalize those kind of results or experiment in American cities to Chinese cities? And what's more, what happens if experiment intervention is scaled up, for example, from the Columbia campus to the city of New York, and then whether it can be transferred to the city of Shanghai. So those are all challenges and questions. So as a result, field experiments have been rarely, if not impossible, applied in urban rural planning. So we have to thank those kind of uh, uh, Nobel laureates in uh, 2021, last year, because they have shown that it's possible to answer these and similar questions by using natural experiment. So here, the key is not a controlled experiment, but rather it's the, uh, to use those kind of situations arising in real life, in which chance events or policy changes result in groups of people being treated differently in a way that resemble, resembles those kind of randomized controlled experiment. So those kind of natural experiment can also occur frequently in the urban settings. For example, those kind of policy changes in some regions of a country. For example, the different environmental regulations in adjacent cities, counties, or resulting from those kind of housing redevelopment, uh, urban regeneration process, or those kind of large scale green park interventions. So here, there's an intended randomness which has exposed some people into treatment while some similar other people not into the treatment so that we can compare those two similar groups. So then back to my research on those kind of environmental pollution and justice issues. So here, uh, a general question you might ask is, for example, does a reduction in air pollution lead to disparities in health benefits between the high income and the low income individuals? Or alternatively, we are, can un, ask the same question in different ways. Does exposure to high levels of air, air pollution cause different adverse health outcomes between the high income and the low income individuals? For example, in terms of incidence of lung cancer. So here, we have to think about those kind of ideal research design. So according to those kind of controlled experiment, so here we really need a so-called cohort studies, which means a longitudinal study where the individuals share a common character. So that's why, for example, in many cases, our urban planning research will be criticized by those kind of public health scholars, because they strongly believe those kind of ideal research design. 
So in that case, those kind of unexposed or less exposed comparison groups should be as similar as possible with regards to other factors that could influence the outcomes being studied. So as you can see here, so the exposed or non-exposed groups, so they should share the same character. And then the only difference is the treatment. So, so some are exposed to higher level exclusion, some are not. And very important, those kind of outcome studies need to be established at least twice. So before the treatment and after the treatment, so that we can confidently compare so-called the causal effects whether exposed to high uh, levels of air pollution lead to differences in health outcomes. However, thanks to those kind of natural experiment as introduced by uh, those kind of uh, natural rollings, so, so that it's possible to answer those kind of similar questions by the so-called natural experiment. For example, here, there's a, a paper done by my colleagues in the Faculty of Business and Economics. You can see they used the Huayhe uh, River as a natural experiment. And you can see here, they did find the significant differences between the northern part and the southern part of the Huayhe uh, 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 River in terms of the life expectancy. So here, this is uh, a the right one shows basically the distance to the Laho River. So think about that. If it's a, a, hun a few hundreds away in the northern part from the Huayhe River, uh, uh, River, or in the southern part of Huayhe River, actually those residents share similar socioeconomic characters. They might also, sh they also share those kind of similar ge geographical context, right? But why? there exist significant differences in terms of life expectancy. So then you have to think about, so what happened between the Northern part and the Southern part of the Huayhe? So, so people uh, might be familiar with those kind of policies, centralized winter heating policy. So say, since the central planning, so Chinese government has provided those kind of uh, uh, centralized Winter hinter in the northern part of the Huayhe River. So, which means people in the northern stay warmer in winter. Because people in the southern part of Huayhe River don't have centralized winter heating system. But the people in the northern also at the cost of those kind of notable worse environmental pollutions. Because those kind of winter heating has contributed significantly to air pollution. You can see. So, similarly, so a few hundreds away in the northern part of Huayhe River. So the pollution in terms of PM10, it's a few dozens higher than that in the north, southern part. So then we can naturally contribute the life expense differences to the differences in air pollution. So this perfectly explains those kind of the beauty of natural experiment. And which also makes those kind of studies possible without doing those kind of experiment, field experiment. And what's more, so at, at this point, we are all talking about the data at the individual level, but for urban scholars, probably it's acceptable for those kind of survey data. Otherwise, it's hard to obtain those kind of large scale individual data. So I also moved to this kind of methodological innovation in so-called ecological studies which a common approach is looking for geographical correlations between for say the average house outcome and the average population exposure. Of course, here the issue is those kind of ecological study cannot be used to make inference about the individual level associations, which is uh, you people usually call those kind of ecological fallacy, right? However, those kind of ecological analysis is still allowing us to make conclusions at an area level. So which can be used, still very important for policy makings at the urban and the rural level, right? At the cities, counties. So they are still very important for sustainable policy makings in environmental uh, sustainability justice. For example, there was a recent so-called ecology study uh, of long-term exposure to air pollution and those kind of COVID-19 outcomes. So which, uh, 
excludes those kind of controlling for individual level risk factors. So by uh, applying those kind of methodological innovations in economics, so now it, it's possible to think about those kind of uh, uh, studies in China in linking air pollution to those kind of uh, social economic disparities. So in fact, the social economic disparities are linked to many environmental hazards in cities, not on air pollution, but also for say, rising heat island effects, copper emissions, flooding rusks. So to us, so those kind of, uh, the importance of sustainable plant tools are to identify, target those kind of right population, right places for policy making that can reduce disparities. So in the next few minutes, I would like to introduce Mike's uh, research. So first one, basically it's still an ecological study. That means it's aggregate level study to uh, examine the link between air pollution and lung cancer incident in China. So which fundamentally is answer one question, who are faced with the great effects? And then, uh, by acknowledging those kind of uh, ecological fallacies, I would also like to move to the individual level analysis and to answer the question of who are more exposed to PM 2.5 pollution. So at a city level, I will use Shenzhen as a case study. So in terms of first question, so basically linking air pollution to lung cancer uh, incident or those kind of health, out, uh, health outcomes. So here, the key research question is whether those kind of PM 2.5 induced health outcomes differ significantly among different socioeconomic groups in China, health leading to a potential case of environmental injustice. So here, uh, to me, uh, the immediate policy uh, planning implication is the potential of developing those kind of urban environment policies better targeted at the appropriate people and place. For example, the urban rural division, the education attainments and the income division. So uh, this is actually our paper published in Environmental International. So here, think about so uh, theoretically, if we link air pollution to the uh, uh, social economic modification effects, theoretically, the relation between air pollution exposure and the house can, can be modified by those kind of social economic positions through differences for say in material resources, biological factors, as well as those kind of psychological stress. So as you can clearly see, so air pollution exaggerates those kind of social economic disparities. Because here, usually the case is the poor are more exposed to air, uh, air pollution, sorry, air pollution, and they are unable to avoid those kind of uh, uh, health consequences from air pollution because of the resource constraints. So basically that leads to a potential case of uh, uh, environmental injustice. So in the study, so uh, we used those kind of health outcome de database, basically it's the China Cancer Registry and Annual Report. So in that annual report, uh, it included uh, in total around 300 cancer registers, which means like uh, counties, urban districts, and uh, covering a population of around two, uh, uh, 200 million in 2014. So you can see the distribution here. And uh, in terms of air pollution, we are able to map out the air pollutions in China in different years. So here you can see that air pollution and the incident cases of male lung cancer. So sorry, so we, in this study, we only use the male because there are different significant difference between male and female uh, cancer and there are different underlying causes. So in this research, so we only use the data for male. So we analyze those, kind, as, as mentioned earlier, those kind of associations at the aggregated area levels, which is county or urban district. And uh, in terms of social inaka, basically this kind of urban rural division, income, education attainments, employment, and urbanization growth rate. 
those kind of things. And uh, basically for the control variables, we also use the uh, weather conditions, location, time, as well as those kind of uh, health and behavior co-variables. Uh, that has nothing to do probably with, with pollution for, for say smoking or other things. So this shows the results of the, so you can see those kind of significant divisions between for say urban rural and then different education attainment. So here we only classified into either two types or three types. So basically low, medium, high or low, high. And then you can also see uh, employment. So uh, the general uh, findings in terms of those kind of socioeconomic modification effects is the relationship between the uh, air pollution exposure and uh, uh, male incidence rate is stronger in urban areas than rural areas. So there is a significant so-called urban rural division. So here, uh, our our primary interpretation would be those differences in for say primary sources of domestic fuels between urban and rural areas in China. And then the differences in probably smoking status. Actually, we also used some kind of this kind of smoking rate data for further sensitivity test. And then the second one is very important is male residents in countries with low economic or education levels have higher risks of PM 2.5 associated lung cancer incidents. So basically this can contribute to this kind of differences in, in avoidance behavior against air pollution because of the socioeconomic status. And the difference is awareness of this kind of air pollution effects on health healthcare. Of course, we found that there are no modification effects of for say the employment status. It, basically it's the employment ratio or the urban growth ratio. So those doesn't really affect the relationship. So this is basically the first study. So that have uh, rely on those kind of so-called methodical innovations and rely on ecological study. But we have to admit the, the ecological forestry issue. Basically there is a so-called uh, air pollution exposure misclassification, probably due to so between area mobility, so people are moving and the within area variations, air quality varies significantly in, in the same urban areas. So, but unfortunately those kind of ecological studies, aggregated studies assume that everyone in the same spatial unit experience the same exposure and leading to those kind of so-called exposure misclassifications, uh, especially for those kind of large spatial units. So that's, that's why we were thinking, how could individual level mobility data help? Because those kind of data will be ex able to indicate the, uh, the mobility within the same area. And by applying other technologies, we are also able to differentiate the air quality within the city. So that leads to our second study. So who are more exposed to air pollution at the city level? So here the research question or the key research question is whether the exposure to this kind of PM2 point of pollution differ significantly among people with different economic status, i.e. Uh, who are more exposed. So here I think uh, uh, the policy or planning implication will be it helps to support those kind of alleviation strategies tailored for specific population, specific place by understanding the spatial association between multi-level economic status and exposure to air pollution. And it also demonstrates, for example, in the future, how those kind of smart technologies and personalized air pollution monitoring will enable the potential of a smart environment to improve the uh, well-being of citizens. So this is our paper, uh, again, published in the Environmental International. So here, as I explained earlier, so basically is the assumption of, for say, home-based air pollution versus those kind of so-called individual space-time-based uh, air pollution. So which accounts for the within city mobility and the uh, uh, intra-city air pollution variations. So you can see, so we, 
made use of those kind of uh, uh, mobile phone data from around 6,000 uh, cell towers in Shenzhen. So we were able to uh, extract the locations uh, by hour on one weekday. And then by those kind of uh, satellite data and uh, uh, machine learning mechanism, we are also able to map the uh, spatial temporal air pollution, for example, from uh, 12, uh, from 0 a.m., 1 a.m. to uh, 23 p.m., right? So basically for 24 hours, hourly air pollution distributions within the city. So then this one shows those kind of uh, 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 cumulative individual exposure, or here I call that individual total exposure. And in relation to the economic status aggregated as a residential community levels. So, so here, a very important challenge I have to admit is in China, the census data doesn't include income data. So here we have to approximate income by using, for example, average uh, housing price, right? So as you can see, so here shows the relation between the daytime exposure, daily exposure, which is 24 hours, and those kind of uh, social economic status of uh, uh, the community level. Oh, this one basically is at the neighborhood level. You can see, so we do see some kind of this linkage between exposure and the social economic status. We also run some regression analysis, which confirms the economic status at both individual and the neighborhood level are strongly linked to the exposure level. So here, if I could summarize the major findings. So people living in areas with a higher residential property price are actually exposed more to those kind of air pollution in Shenzhen. So here, a first question, as I mentioned earlier, whether Shenzhen is a traditional Chinese city. So probably we have to put a question mark. So that means, uh, is it possible to generalize the findings from Shenzhen to urban China? And the other thing is actually, uh, our findings contributed to the literature on exposure disparities in the developing settings where exposure disparity has not been well understood. And the pattern of this kind of exposure disparity may be so different from that in the Western countries, especially in the uh, Northern, uh, Northern America. So our potential explanation for the different findings is the difference in the pattern of so-called urbanization-induced re residential segregation across different economic, uh, socioeconomic groups in China, which is different from that in the Western settings. So in the Western countries, a typical social uh, uh, spatial pattern involves a rich program of people with high incomes who tend to live far away from cent city center, right? While the poor are having to live in central areas. In contrast, a typical pattern of residential segregation in relation to the urbanization in urban China, or particularly here in Shenzhen, involves this kind of concentration of the media income, uh, medium high income people in the city centers and the resultant displacement of the poor to the urban uh, fringe. At the same time, those kind of urbanized, uh, rapid urbanization in China usually result in higher population density, high intensity of human activities in the central areas than in those kind of outskirts. So which usually leads to a more severe air pollution situation in the central areas. So combining those two, so probably it leads to the findings that like people living in areas with a higher residential property price are more exposed to PM 2.5 exposures in the case study of Shenzhen. So of course, so by reflecting those kind of findings, so we have to acknowledge the, the, the challenges, the problems. So the first issue of course is those kind of approximating individual socioeconomic status by the building level property price. This, this, this is not ideal, but unfortunately, in the Chinese context, in the census data without income data, we probably that's the best we can do. Of course, another one, if you're linking back to so-called the natural experiment, 
think about it. do we have something to specialize this kind of social economic segregation? Actually, the answer is yes. Urban villages could also be a good natural experiment because those kind of urban villages naturally divided rather than into groups. And, and it can help us answer the very important question. Are individuals living in urban villages exposed to higher level of, of air pollution exposures? So this actually will probably give our a different perspective on the same question. Linking back to uh, the, the challenges uh, in the post pandemic area and the, uh, in the face of climate change. Actually, this is a very interesting case. I was reading a, a paper on nature communications last week on how this kind of decarbonization in California actually leads to more equitable air quality in California. So I was also thinking the same question. Will those kind of uh, uh, carbon neutral efforts, decarbonizing efforts, lead to more equitable air quality in urban China? So this, this will be a great question for future research, right? So probably uh, given the time limits, I will conclude here. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, questions, comments are more than welcome. Thank you, Professor Lee, for your enlightening presentation. Um, can we all give, first of all, give a full round of applause for both Professor Lee and Professor Tian for their time. Um, everybody will virtual clap. Um, so is, if anybody has, any, so we'll open it up to questions directly for Professor Lee for now. Um, if anybody has any questions, please go ahead. Uh, I do actually have a question from WeChat. Uh, Jennifer from WeChat asks if it would be possible to get your reports, uh, the, some of the reports that you uh, have shown us over the presentation. Oh, actually, yes. So the two papers on environmental international actually are urban uh, source, so you can download it anywhere. You can download it online? Yes, yes. Great, great. We'll share the link afterwards. We'll, um, we'll ask you for it afterwards. Um, and so, uh, if, does anybody ha else have any questions? Uh, yes, I have a question. Do you see the hand? Yes, sure. Okay. Um, so, uh, Li Laoshi, thank you very much. Um, you actually brought up some really um, pro I say provocative dilemmas that we have to discuss, right? So the Shenzhen's case is interesting because um, not all Western cities have the more wealthy on the uh, on the suburbs, right? It has to do with history of yeah. cities. Where, you know, if you look go to Europe, um, much of the city centers were uh, occupied by fairly wealthy residents. Yeah, right. So yeah. if the conclusion from your Shenzhen study is that, you know, uh, city centers are more polluting, I think it kind of beat the purpose of, so be, so it sort of presents us with another key question as planners. We want people to come back to the city centers, right? We don't want them to all go to suburbs. <laughs> and so that's a tough question then, right? So do you want to have more pollution or better air quality, or do you want to have more access or accessibility? So how do you reconcile this, right? So I'm wondering, this natural experiment may be somewhat problematic because, um, you know, uh, Western cities oftentimes, you know, I ask my students, why do you find the richest areas often uh, to the west part of a city? It's mm -hmm. because people going for air quality. But Shenzhen developed so quickly and the choice of where to de develop what kinds of residential areas were not made with, you know, for by developers with lots of considerations in mind, right? Um, so I'm actually, you know, also air quality is so in a sense elusive that, that mm -hmm. you know, one part of the city next day could be the other part of the city. It's a little bit different from water quality. So I'm just curious how you kind of reconcile these kinds of uh, conflicting um, 
conclusions and the, the, the dilemmas it, it presents to us as urban researchers and planners. Thank you. Yeah, Professor, this is a great question. Yeah, I also uh, always think about this kind of dilemma. Yes. So, so uh, to me, so because of the rapid uh, urbanization in sense and probably so over the past like uh, a few decades, so probably uh, planners, policy makings uh, uh, didn't have time to really think about it. So, uh, uh, air quality issues, environmental sustainability ahead of those kind of economic growth. So. I was thinking actually the uh, pandemic economic slowdown pro probably provided the best opportunities for, for policymakers to reconcile those kind of uh, economic development and environmental quality. So which so basically now has been the uh, dream of middle class. So, so that's why I put the last question here. Think about it. So in, in the era of post pandemic, climate change. So probably people are talking about this kind of carbon neutrality efforts in China, in European, in North America. And those kind of efforts actually uh, are naturally consoled with those kind of efforts to reduce air quality in some sense. So uh, that's why I was also asking this question, what will those kind of uh, carbon neutrality efforts actually reduce air quality and lead to a more equitable air quality in urban China. So which basically means for, for those kind of uh, gym areas in the city, basically the central areas, uh, the air quality will be higher and then that will uh, attract more so-called middle high income people. So, so that's, that's some of those kind of uh, thoughts I had on reconciling those kind of dilemmas at this point. Thank you so much, Professor Wu, for your question. Um, and so uh, if there's any, not know any other questions from the audience, I just had a quick question about um, the climate justice, move, the climate justice movement, which is something that's very popular here in the United States. Um, we have like, in fact, I think every single urban planning student coming into Columbia has to read this book called Climate Justice from the Streets, which is kind of detailing how in American cities, uh, a lot of uh, uh, like in climate injustice intersects with racial and class injustice. Do you see movements like that happening in China? Yeah, yeah, this, this is a great question. Actually, yeah, I was also reading some of the papers last week on, for example, those kind of, uh, the US cities uh, have been increasingly put those kind of climate justice or environmental justice actions into uh, the climate change actions. And uh, this question, here as a question like decarbonization uh, has led to more equitable air quality in California. So I was also thinking, so the so way for uh, Chinese cities uh, uh, towards so-called uh, climate justice. So I actually, I was thinking uh, those kind of uh, uh, bring, bring together those kind of dialogues in, in inequalities in terms of air quality climate change and those kind of socioeconomic disparities. So I, I do see those kind of movement as my, I explained earlier. So it's, it's possible those kind of, so, uh, for Chinese cities to justify those kind of air quality uh, man, man, management uh, measures in clean areas by discussing those kind of uh, global connections, fairnesses, and more importantly, so uh, in answering Professor Wu's question earlier, so basically very important is for policymakers to reconcile those kind of dilemmas in the opportunities that arise from pandemic as well as those kind of economic slowdown. So they have to think about, so what's the future for urban development in China? Absolutely. Um, thank you for that answer. That I think that enlightens quite a bit. Um, so we're going to actually open up the discussion panel. Um, so uh, any like people can ask questions to both Professor uh, uh, like Tian and Professor Li. Um, if there is any uh, question, like no question, I can get uh, the ball started. So uh, 
Professor Lee, Professor Tian, thank you so much for your lectures. Uh, I was just wondering, from both of your perspective, how do the um uh, like what like where does climate justice and where does urban regeneration come from? Like in China, like does it come from more from the government level? Does it come from civil societies? There is a lot of movements here, and I guess this is similar to the question I was asking with Professor Lee. There's like a lot of movements here that's coming from civic groups. Is that is that a uh, something that is, exists in China right now? Uh, urban civic groups that kind of are trying to fight for uh, more sustainable urban regeneration, more like historical preservation um, and climate justice. This is a question for both uh, Professor Tian and mm -hmm. Professor. Oh, Professor Tian, would you like to start? Oh, okay. Uh, sorry. Oh, sorry, Professor Tian, probably you have to unmute yourself. Oh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I think you, you can start. Uh, you can. Okay. You know, sir, first, because I, I think his question is more about like climate uh, justice, something like that. And, okay, yeah. and urban regeneration as well. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like the two are very closely tied at the current, like, say, at least here in the United States. Um, like, climate disasters mm -hmm. have been kind of on the forefront of how, like, uh, urban, like, cities think about regeneration and preservation um, and adaptation. Um, so if uh, either of you could, I would love to hear from either of you how you see governments working with civil society. Sure, I guess this is, this is a great question. And I probably I will put uh, uh, the question into the great framework provided by Professor Tian. So basically it's a triangle among so-called the government, uh, society and the market. So, so in terms of for, for say environmental justice, climate justice in Chinese cities, I would say so probably uh, this has been uh, more popular because of so-called uh, Chinese cities turn to so-called a consumer city. So probably as uh, as mentioned by Professor Xi Zheng at MIT. So, so consumers in consu in the consumer city, so probably residents will value environmental sustainability, value air quality, and this will reflect it into the property price. So this gives incentives for both the government developers. So basically uh, incentives to increase uh, sorry, uh, to, to enhance air quality, enhance those kind of so-called climate actions, for example, those kind of car, car decarbonization efforts, because this will be valued in the market and this will be reflected in the property uh, price uh, in the, uh, so, uh, so in China, so those kind of uh, land sales uh, are still the key sources for local government revenues, right? So, so I see the movement from uh, the market side to the developers, to the government. So in that triangling, probably I think it will become more popular in terms of uh, environmental justice, climate justice, and then towards more those kind of so-called carbon neutrality efforts, which in fact also helps to re reduce air pollution. Okay. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Lee. I think it's my turn to answer this question. Um, I, I prefer uh, to call the redevelopment of China as urban renew instead of urban regeneration. Uh, according to uh, British planners, urban regeneration involves, uh, you know, social, economic, and environmental uh, aspects. So it's more like comprehensive. Uh, it addresses uh, more on like uh, the supply of public goods and social inequity, uh, social equity, and some you know environmental issues as mentioned as Professor Lee mentioned. But in or has been more how to say that property led. Uh, you know during the, like in Guangzhou and Shenzhen, uh, a lot of uh, old buildings uh, were demolished 
uh, to uh, you know high new high rise buildings uh, have been built. Uh, we call this kind of uh, gentrification, like in Shanghai in the central area renovation. The plan, to be honest, you know, to be, um, you know, the plan of government is kind of formal uh, gentrification uh, because they want to replace our buildings with high end quality of buildings. So, so I, 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 I don't like, you know, I, I so I prefer. Um, you know, to call it as um, urban renew. Um, I'm not optimistic about uh, the collaboration between government and the civic society uh, in the urban renew of China. Not just in urban renew field, for other fields, you know, as I mentioned, the long history of China has revealed social forces have been very, very weak. Uh, so I, in, in this science, I, you know, I'm kind of uh, pessimistic on the collaboration between government and the civic society. It's more kind of government dominant in every aspect of economic and social and environmental lives of Chinese people. Uh, I think I, you know, may, this is my personal uh, viewpoint, uh, but of course, um, you know, we should, we should, uh, we shouldn't say, oh, then we can do nothing, uh, but we shouldn't expect too much. Thank you, Professor Dian, Professor Lee. Um, I think we have a, a question from the audience. Uh, Christian, do you want to go ahead? Yes, sure. Thank you so much for both of your presentations. They were really, really interesting. Um, I am from Germany, and I think this question is more for you, Professor Lee. And we're also facing uh, several air quality issues inside the city, and it's mostly caused by automobiles and trucks. And so far, Germany has only given the limit as in a state level, while the city itself has to implement the actual methods and tools to reduce the air pollution, like tolling, congestion pricing, or something similar. And as you can imagine, the results are quite mixed, mostly based on the political will of a governing party in the city itself. And my question for you is, do you think that it's more effective to improve air quality um, by a city or federal state level or directly by the state, especially with the difference between Germany's and China's political system? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Christian, for the great question. Yeah. This, uh, uh, this, this, this is a very interesting question. Actually, so uh, as you probably know, uh, and also as explained by uh, Professor Tian, like in terms of uh, urban generation, different Chinese cities have different strategies. Actually, this, uh, to me, I think it's also similar uh, in Chinese cities in reducing air uh, pollution. So basically, as you mentioned, so uh, within cities, probably the major pollution sources are aut automobiles. And in Chinese cities, automobile uh, uh, ownership has been increasing significantly over the past decade. So basically for local government, uh, one key challenge uh, to control air quality is to how to manage this called uh, mob uh, uh, and restrict basically uh, automobiles. So basically two things. One thing is in terms of ownership. So, so in that sense, you can see, so Beijing and uh, uh, Shanghai are doing very differently. In Shanghai, it's a lottery system. So, sorry, in Shanghai, it's, it's, a, it's a bidding system, right? It's a market force bidding system, while in Beijing, it's a lottery system. And then the other one is basically usage, right? Usage, so basically how to control uh, automobile usage. Of course, this has been very rare <laughs> recently because of uh, uh, the reduced activities uh, from COVID. But, but uh, think about the pre-COVID time. So uh, Beijing was implementing this kind of uh, uh, single uh, day uh, usage, all those kind of usage by 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 the odds number or <laughs> all those kind of policies. So so and and in terms of policy transfer, it's even interesting. You can think about so basically bidding system, uh, lottery systems, and then think about how other cities 
were learning from those kind of systems. For example, Guang, in Guangzhou, basically, they have combined the lottery and the bidding system. So basically half by bidding, half by lottery. So those kind of interesting combinations in terms of policy transfer and policy learning. So, so to me, so this, this is very similar in Chinese cities if compared to German cities. So somehow it, it also depends on those kind of political wills. Uh, but uh, if we move from air quality to carbon emission, so currently it's probably carbon emission is a more important issue because of carbon neutrality efforts. In that sense, basically, I think most of the Chinese cities are, are relying on the market, uh, market uh, forces. Basically, they are the so-called carbon trading systems in many city regions in China. And China is uh, planning to develop a nationwide a carbon trading system similar to the European carbon trading system. So it's, it's more relying on those kind of market forces. So I, I hope uh, I answered your question, but to be frank, uh, we don't have data to show which one is more effective at this point. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Ying Lei. We have a question from Yining Lei. Yining. Hi, thank you. Um, hi, Professor Lee. Uh, this is a question for Professor Lee. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for your presentation. And um, my question this time might be a little bit general. Um, I'm interested in uh, your research about the relationship between um, the air pollution and disease. Um, um, from a social uh, science scholar's perspective, I am kind of wondering how should we um, confidently draw their causal relationship between these two factors. Uh, because from my understanding, I feel like um, um, the, the possibility of disease is also impacted by people's lifestyle, individual's lifestyle, uh, and also maybe they have some initial disease that is not uh, easily detected by uh, researchers, something like that. Um, I am also trying to relate this to um, um, the, the health impact assessments that is uh, featured in Healthy China 2030 and also the 14th um, five-year plan. Um, some of the scholars that I um, talked with also talked about the difficulty to really carry out that, that assessment because they also feel it's really hard to monitor uh, if a certain event will uh, impact on people's uh, individuals' health. So um, look forward to your insights and comments on this. Yeah, so this is a great question and it's, it also imposes a great challenge. So that's why I started my talk by uh, discussing those kind of uh, causal relationship and how to adjust those kind of causal relationship in, in economic terms. So to be frank, so, so uh, the, the issues for us, for say urban scholars in assessing those kind of relationships uh, will be very much criticized by scholars in public health. Because for scholars in public health, they only believe, as I mentioned, the cohort studies, basically a longitudinal observation of people share the same characters. So yeah, yeah, absolutely right. So only by observing those kind of people with same characters and expose them to for say different air pollution, different hazards. So uh, is it possible for us to confidently draw some conclusions in terms of uh, health outcomes? So that's why like uh, in our faculties, some of the colleagues are relying on those kind of cohort database. For example, there's uh, the UK Biobank in which they have data for half million citizens in United Kingdom across different cities. And uh, we also have so-called the Hong Kong family cohort, so in which, which was developed by uh, the medical faculty in uh, the University of Hong Kong. So uh, uh, our colleagues are working with them. And uh, here, uh, a, a very important thing is for public health scholars, probably they are not paying attention to the role played by the built environment. So they are basically, as you mentioned, interested in those kind of gene effects, interested in the lifestyle effects on, on the health outcomes. So for us, so it's possible for us to build a so-called as a built environment database and link those kind of built environment contributions to the health outcome. 
So that's, to me, I think that's the beauty of this collaboration between urban scholars and public health scholars. So, so in the end, so uh, we are able to stay on the same boat and for some uh, meaningful studies. Otherwise, to be frank, so I wrote a few proposals on this one and they were all criticized by the public health scholars. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much for your answer. <laughs> okay, um, so we have to uh, wrap up now because the next class is gonna use our like classroom very soon. So we wanna first of all, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Tian Li and Professor Li Weifeng for their enlightening lectures, urban sustainability and the effects of urban generation and uh, environmental destruction is extremely on, increasingly focused uh, like in, on in China and around the world and on the forefront of government and economic concerns. We really appreciate hearing the insightful research of the two professors and we'll share it will be very useful for like the students research from now on. If any other students have questions, please let us know on WeChat or by email. And if it's okay with both professors, uh, we'll like package it and send it to you guys and you guys can get back to us on that. Um, yes, so uh, thank you. And also thank you to Professor Wu uh, and the rest of the UP office for sponsoring this event. And thank you to Columbia Global Centers for streaming it. We really appreciate everybody's support and we hope everybody has a wonderful weekend. Thank you so much. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you.